Thank you very much for coming. Such a great number today. It's good to have many young people. You know, many less young people as well, <laughs> but uh, equally respectable uh, to, uh, to exchange, to talk about Europe, to talk about the US, to talk about the world and uh, the things we can do together. Uh, thank you very much for the organizers, University of Texas, the sponsors, and all of those that contributed to this event. I know this is the beginning of a cycle. I hope it will be a long and successful cycle. We are very happy to work with the University of Texas opening a, a European center here. We have about 10 uh, throughout the US, and I'm very happy that we are for the first time having one here in Texas, I guess. Is it the first time? Turn to my people. Yeah, it is the first time. So it's even more important that we open a new area of cooperation with, um, with this great uh, state uh, of Texas. I was meeting just a while ago the Secretary of State, Hope uh, Andrade, and we were uh, going through the bilateral relationship, and I was, again, uh, you know, surprised, positively surprised by the role Europe plays in this state. Uh, you know, our member states are responsible for more than 45% of foreign direct investment in Texas, as you will see from the little page uh, that has been distributed around, gives you a few figures about the relationship. So it's great to be here, particularly because uh, uh, you have such a great weather. Uh, we left Washington and very heavy rain, and uh, we had a hot and humid summer over there, so it's good to be here, like in this kind of weather, which reminds me of my hometown, uh, Lisbon in Portugal, the west coast of Europe. We have this kind of weather, and uh, so it's great to be here. And I'll be listening to some music tonight because I'm a great fan of Austin's uh, City Limits that I watched uh, uh, a number of times over in Europe. So great to be here. Uh, the issue I would like to um, touch upon today is, as you can see from the announcement on the conference, uh, the reasons why I think the, the, euro, the euro will survive. Um, but before replying to that question, I think we need to uh, reply to a few other questions. So I've lined up a little bit of a, of a questionnaire that I will put myself and I will reply in front of you and maybe we could um, uh, further down the road uh, discuss. And the, I, I think there are fundamentally four questions that one needs to try to reply to as one thinks about uh, the situation in Europe its impact on the United States and the world. And the first question is, why is there a Euro crisis? The second one would be, why should the US be concerned and how? The third one is, why uh, is Europe, why do I think that Europe is on the right track to come out of this crisis? And the last one is the one that brought you here, uh, why will the Euro in the end survive? And I think if we don't try to reply to these questions, we, we miss a, a few points about what we're doing here. So why is there a Euro crisis? And I'll try to be simple and short, that we are addressing a very complex reality. But I think it's worth, for all of you interested in these issues, to, to go a bit into the substance of it. Well, the first point I'd like to raise is that what we are having today in Europe as much as in the US, is uh, an aftershock of the 2008 financial crisis, first and foremost. This uh, negative impact of the financial crisis was even more negative in the countries that were more uh, vulnerable in terms, for instance, of public finances. Uh, the crisis forced the member states of the European Union to spend a lot in what, what one would consider welfare state measures. You know, supply, uh, support for unemployed, support for companies in difficulty, uh, because the situation was very hard in 2008, 2009. They also had to uh, design and implement stimulus measures, as you did here in the US. You know, we were at the end of 2008, very serious situation. We need to inject money into the economy to make it 
work and to prevent some of the very harsh situations we had in the Great Depression after in the 30s. But we also had to support the banking system, which is sometimes unpopular here and there, but fundamentally the banking system is the, you know, the central system of any economy. If you let it break down, I mean the whole economy can go down the drain. And this, of course, was uh, required a, a particular effort from, from countries and, and governments. But also when you have a downturn in, in the economic activity, you lose revenues. So you have an imbalance, you have to spend more, you get less uh, uh, on, the, on the revenue side, so you have an imbalance. And fundamentally, uh, the problems that we are having today in Europe have a lot to do with what happened around the financial, uh, the financial crisis. Countries were more affected than others because their starting point was a weaker one. If you take the case of Greece and compare it with Germany, it's obvious that these kind of situations I described are more difficult to handle in an economy which on top of that uh, would have other problems, such as, in the case of Greece, uh, 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 issues of relatively weak competitiveness as compared to other competitors in the market. And the other element, of course, is that against all this, which are facts, uh, you have the markets. And the markets react in a way which sometimes, of course, aggravates the problem. It's an issue of confidence, an issue of trust. There's a lot of psychology in the economy, as you well know. Uh, and uh, the role of the markets, the way they react to the situations, of course, is a major factor. But apart from these realities of economic and finance uh, dimension linked to the crisis of 2008, one must recognize, and I have no problem in recognizing, that the European Union, and particularly this economic and monetary union of 17 countries sharing the same currency, the euro, within a 27 large uh, European Union, this organization was not fully equipped uh, to face a financial crisis like the one uh, we had in the last couple of years. They were not able, we were not able to fully contain uh, the individual uh, country's problems without them having a sort of uh, perception contagion in the whole uh, system. And this is, again, one of the problems that we have uh, today. Another reason why there is a crisis today, or perceived as such at least, is that we have a decision making which is slower than markets would have expected. Because we are a complex structure. We are 27 countries, 27 democracies, 27 oppositions, 27 parliaments. Uh, that function in a democratic way. Meaning, you know, you have to discuss, you have to disagree before you agree. Uh, uh, it takes time, it makes a lot of noise. Uh, so it's a complex and sometimes cumbersome uh, decision-making uh, process that uh, requires, most of the cases, a consensus among member states. And this, of course, makes uh, the process of finding a consensus more difficult than in a country which has, you know, a more homogeneous environment to deal with. Although, even in countries that are more homogeneous than 27 countries being together, sometimes, as you well know from your particular case, it is not easy even when you have only one government, one president, two parties, and one Congress, uh, it's sometimes difficult to get consensus. So imagine that and multiply it by 27, and you can understand how difficult it is for us to find solutions, which of course, in the middle of the crisis, uh, makes things more difficult. And this is, of course, a, a, an element to take in consideration. But also, the crisis surprised all of us uh, by its uh, intensity. We were not prepared, not in the US, not in Europe or elsewhere, to face such a, an, an acute and serious 
uh, crisis. And populations and public opinions were not necessarily ready to uh, react to it, to pay the price for, uh, you know, the adaptation to it. And uh, this has created political tension inside our countries. Uh, you know, very, very lively debate, uh, polarization of opinions, and again, I could be describing the situation in the U.S. as I described the one, uh, the one in Europe. But there is a political dimension as well here that translates into the difficulty that the politicians have in Europe, but maybe elsewhere as well, to explain to the voters what is at stake. And the temptation that we sometimes have to oversimplify and to present very complex realities in a too simple way, which sometimes leads people to conclusions that are not compatible with the degree of complexity of the issues that we are talking about. And this is not, does not facilitate reaching consensus that require sacrifices, that require people to, uh, you know, put aside interests, immediate interests, in view of future uh, rewards. So all this uh, political dimension added to the economic uh, difficulties make uh, uh, even more difficult for any of us, any country, to react to uh, such a serious uh, crisis. But of course, we do all this not in isolation. We do this in an international environment. And of course, the international environment as we speak is not the most positive one in economic terms. We fundamentally have a, a slowdown in our recovery, uh, even affecting now the, the emerging economies. It's more difficult to take hard decisions when things are not going well elsewhere, all our economies are interconnected. Uh, we are affected by the situation in China as much as China is affected by our situation. So it's uh, even more difficult to do so in these kind of times. So these are some of the reasons why one can consider that today we have a crisis situation within uh, the euro area. Economic reasons, political factors, international context uh, coming together at the same time to uh, create a mix of factors that result into a, a very difficult situation to, to handle. My second question is why should the, should the US be concerned about this and how should the US react to such a, a situation in Europe? I would start by saying that if there is one lesson that I think we should have learned from the financial crisis of 2008 is that, uh, as I used to say, we are in this together. There is no such thing as, that's your problem, not mine. What happens in California, some prime mortgage market affects the whole world. That's where it all started, some say. Uh, what happens in a country of 12 million inhabitants like Greece can affect the whole world. That's what some say. The fact being that uh, if you have an interconnected global economy, you know, where our mobile phones have about 30 or 40 uh, components coming from 30 or 40 different locations, uh, when you can no longer say that this is a Chinese product or an American product, uh, you are bound to have a cross effect. You know, anything, again, done in one side can affect the other. So I think we should have understood that we are, not, we are not alone, we are not isolated, and that we have to consider that. It's very difficult to throw the first stone to the neighbor's greenhouse. I don't know if you say this in English, but anyway, uh, I think you understand what I mean. Because we are all vulnerable. We are all vulnerable. Uh, so I think one needs to show a certain degree of modesty and recognize that no system is perfect, 
my neighbor is not doing better than I do. Or maybe he is today, but things will change tomorrow. So uh, it's very important from our point of view that the US and the EU look at this as a joint challenge that requires joint uh, action and joint solutions. I think this is much better than uh, finger pointing or second guessing or uh, you know, trying to, you know, here and there, blame the other for my own problems. And then I say this, uh, I'm thinking of things I heard in Europe about the US and things I heard in the US about Europe. So again, no one here is more guilty than, than the other. Uh, but I think we need responsible politicians and academic and scholars and all those that look at these issues need to highlight the importance of uh, cooperation across the Atlantic in trying to solve these issues. Because our problems and the solution for our problems will uh, benefit the United States. The, the problems affect the solutions will benefit. And the other way around is uh, also, uh, also right. Uh, we have committed ourselves to do a number of efforts inside the G20 as a result, as a reaction to the crisis. I'm not sure we have all uh, remain, you know, loyal to our commitments. I think all of us still have a number of things to, to do that we have committed to do in order to help the world recovery, and that is valid for the US as much as it is for, uh, for the European Union. But also when we look at the way the US should react, or we should interact, uh, it's also important to put things in perspective. And sometimes I hear uh, in the US a lot about, I mean, Europe is the real problem. Europe is in a very bad shape and very bad situation. Uh, and I was the first to recognize that we have a serious problem in Europe. But I think it's also important that we stick to the reality of the figures. And if I take two indicators which are relevant for our discussion, one is the level of the, the budgetary deficit and the other is the level of public debt. Uh, if you compare Europe and Europe's average, or the euro area average, I mean, anyway, uh, if you look at Europe as such, forgetting individual countries, and if you look at the United States and you try to compare the figures, on the, on the budgetary deficit, Europe is around 6% of GDP, and the US is above 9% of GDP. If you look at the public debt, Europe is around 85% of GDP. The US is above 93%. So I'm not taking any political conclusion out of this. I'm just putting the figures on the table to show that, in fact, we have basically the same problems. And if you look at the figures on average, I would say that the US has a little bit more of a problem in these two indicators than Europe has. The problem in Europe is, of course, that we are not a country, that we have very diverse realities, and that some of these countries, which are component part of the European Union, have very serious uh, situations, and that these situations affect the entire system. Uh, I think it's important to, to work out. And also the reaction of the markets against these figures uh, you would agree with me that markets have been slightly more demanding on Europe than they have been on other uh, countries. And slightly more demanding on, on countries like Greece, uh, Portugal, or Ireland than, than other countries. But that's a reality with which we have to, uh, to live uh, with. So my message here is to say our industrialized, post-industrialized countries the whole of Europe, the United States, we, have fundamentally, we are fundamentally facing the same kind of problems, structural problems, problems of the link to the present state of the economy and the financial situation. Uh, we have learned from this crisis that we cannot sort get out of this crisis alone, that we need to act together, and this is the spirit I would like to see. So my res reply to the question, should the U.S. be concerned? Yes. How should the U.S. react? I believe by joining efforts with Europe uh, bilaterally and in multilateral fora to create
create the conditions for a sustainable uh, recovery. My third question is, why do I believe that Europe is on the right track? Well, first of all, because we've, uh, we've done in the last 18 months or two years uh, quite a lot. Uh, first of all, we had to address the most urgent problems, Greece, Ireland and Portugal. We have created new instruments that were not foreseen before. We are making sure now that these instruments are not only temporary, but they become permanent uh, mechanism. And we are reforming, revamping the way we govern our economic area. So uh, I believe we are, in fact, uh, doing a small revolution in the way we organize our uh, economic and monetary union in, in Europe. So because we are showing this determination, I think this is a reason for uh, optimism. But we are even thinking of going beyond the boundaries that we have today, meaning beyond the, the treaties, which is a sort of constitution of Europe. And we are thinking also admitting the possibility of changing these treaties if we need to have instruments that are not foreseen in these treaties. There is also a, an acute awareness inside Europe today that we need to do more than we have done up to now. So what we have done was absolutely indispensable, necessary, useful, relevant, but not enough. So what I sense today in Europe is a sense of uh, urgency, momentum for you know, a new qualitative leap forward in the way we deal with this situation. We need to address the, the situation in Greece, which is the most difficult and urgent one. We need to prevent this situation from having a contagion effect on other member states, and there are a number of things being studied about that. We have to maximize the impact of the crisis mechanisms that we introduced. We need to enhance their scope, increase their capacity to act. We need to go back to the banking system, and some of our banks need uh, further support and recapitalization. Fourthly, we need not to forget that nothing makes sense without the perspective of growth. Austerity does not make sense if it is not uh, if it doesn't aim at creating conditions for growth and sustainable growth. This is a debate in the US as well, as we all know. And last but not least, we need to do more to uh, revamp the governance, the way we govern our affairs in Europe, which, is, uh, proved, which has proved to be not up to the, to the level of demand that we had in a financial crisis. And I come to my last question before I turn it to you. Uh, which is, of course, the, 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 the million dollar question, which is, why do I think that the euro will survive? Well, first of all, because it makes sense. And sometimes what makes sense is powerful. Sometimes. Not always. Uh, but the euro makes sense. Why? Because it is the supreme stage of integration, I would say, of countries that have already a substantial degree of economic integration. You know, we have a single market. We have free circulation of people, goods, capitals, and services around the union. We have a customs union, that is, we apply the same tariffs to the outside partners all over the union. It is a, an economically integrated uh, space, it makes sense that it also has a single currency, a single monetary policy, what we call an economic and monetary union. So the euro makes sense as part of this project of bringing countries closer together. And the euro has been good for business and for consumers throughout its existence. If you take inflation, we have controlled inflation around 2% in the first decade of the euro. The decades before, we had in, in the 70s around 9 to 
in the 80s around 7%. We brought it down to 2%. If you take uh, monetary stability, you can consider that it would have been much more difficult to deal with the financial crisis of 2008 if we had, instead of one, if we had 16 or 17 currencies. Because the pressure on the weaker currencies would have been great, even unsustainable. You would have a extremely difficult monetary situation to handle at the time. If you look at employment, the results of the first 10 years of the euro was a net increase of 16 million jobs in Europe. All this and many other figures I could quote reinforce the idea that the euro is good for our member states, is good for business, is good for consumers, is good for tourists who don't have to change money every time they change country, uh, is good for investors from the outside, and it's good for uh, business activity as a whole. But it also enhances Europe's role in the world. Uh, the euro uh, very soon became the second world currency after the dollar. And the place it has in the world's reserves is more than the addition, than the sum of the 16 countries or 17 currencies that we had before. So it has enhanced Europe's weight in the world economic uh, scene. So these are some, let's say, economic reasons why uh, I believe the euro will survive. It makes sense, it's good for the countries, it's good for people, it's good for business. But there are some more political reasons why I believe the euro will survive. And the first one is that the implosion of the euro area, if it would ever happen, which I don't think will be the case, would be very costly, extremely costly, with unpredictable consequences for uh, our own uh, member states. It will be difficult to manage inside and outside the Union. And the negative impact of such a hypothetical implosion of the euro area would impact negatively, will be felt equally by what one could call central core countries of the euro area as much as uh, the peripheral countries of the euro area. So if you want it to be as negative for Germany as it will be for Ireland, Portugal, or Greece. And, and these are, of course, important elements to consider before you admit the possibility of, uh, of a failure in this area. But even more important and even more political, the euro is a core element of a political project. And it's a big mistake to analyze or assess the euro simply as an economic or monetary tool. Doing that is missing, largely missing the point. The, the euro is a, an instrument of political union. It's part of a project that started in the 50s and that has been immensely successful. The project is basically to establish an ever closer union among European countries, putting an end to centuries of war, millions of millions of Europeans killed by Europeans. So what we've done in the last 54 years, since the end of the Second World War, if you want to start there, with the help of America, the European project is also an American project, and we are you know, very happy with that and very proud to share this dream with you, <clears throat> if you allow us to share your dream also with, with us. Uh, I think we have common aspirations here. Uh, we cannot let, we will not let uh, the euro crisis put this project into question. And these are uh, extremely important considerations, sometimes missing from uh, you know, a more economic analysis of the euro situation uh, today. 
So a failure of the euro, an implosion of the euro area, or any scenario of this kind, will have huge political consequences. And I believe that our European leaders have that in mind when they say that they will not let the euro, uh, the euro fail. Today, our leaders are discussing. There are many phone calls taking place today, tomorrow, Saturday. We are preparing an important summit on Sunday. Uh, but I see a little bit too high expectations here and there about this summit, the European Council, which is where all the heads of state and government, presidents or prime ministers of the 27 countries join, uh, uh, come together for a meeting. Uh, I'm expecting positive results out of that meeting, but we should not uh, have too high expectations because this process, as I tried to explain, are complex and difficult and take time. But I believe that positive news will come out of Brussels over Sunday. Uh, it, this is a process. This is not one meeting that decides everything and then we have a solution. It will take time. But the message I want to convey to you today is that uh, Europe will come out of this crisis stronger and fitter. Uh, what we are discussing in Brussels today is not how, you know, is not what kind of steps backward we, we, we're going to take. What, what we are discussing in Brussels today is how far and how fast do we want to move forward. This is the debate today. There are disagreements, there are different views, different solutions, but always, all, them, all of them basically aim at providing us with more Europe, not with uh, less Europe. And uh, as we speak, I think there's in a, there is an increased awareness of the need for us to move forward and move fast. And that's what I expect in the coming days, in the coming weeks, in the coming months, out of Europe, so I bring to you a message of optimism, a realism, uh, begging you to understand the complexity of the situation in Europe, sometimes desperately complex, uh, having in mind that uh, fundamentally Europe and the US have the same problems to deal with, they share the same, fundamentally, the same strategic interests, we have a lot of values in common, we have the strongest possible relationship in the world across the Atlantic, so we should try and do our best to cooperate to come out of this crisis, both sides of the Atlantic, in better shape than we started. Thank you. I believe the ambassador will entertain questions. Yes, 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 very much. So, so there's a microphone in case you can't hear, but uh, go ahead. Um, thank you, Ambassador. That was um, a really wonderful speech. It really was huge. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about um, uh, businesses that do work or want to do work in, uh, in the EU. Uh, currently, City of Boston businesses have multi billions uh, invested with Mexican companies. Um, the $10 billion, $10 billion of investment from Korean countries. Um, earlier this year, um, over 100 businesses in Austin um, expressed an interest in doing work and partnerships with uh, EU countries. And we haven't found a conduit for doing that. Is there uh, a mechanism for doing work with the EU, or do local businesses have to deal with individual countries? Thank you, and uh, I say hello to the Mexican consul, wherever he is. <laughs> uh, she. she, madam. Thank you. Uh, I, I know you have a strong relationship with Mexico, and I'm very happy for that. I know that NAFTA is producing uh, important results. Uh, we also have uh, agreements with Mexico, and uh, we also look forward to future cooperation with, with Mexico. But I, if I look at the figures, I see uh, a very solid position for European countries here. Uh, five countries uh, 
you know, at the top of the league of the biggest investors in Texas, so I'm very happy for that. Uh, I think we have uh, very good results in our cooperation, and I thank you for our interest uh, in Europe. So I would like to say that, uh, I mean, you should contact my people in, 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 in Washington. I think we, uh, we can provide you with all the, the contacts, and they will be ready to facilitate whatever you uh, want to, to do with Europe. Uh, but I must realize that you know, it, it has still a lot to do with member states because they are sovereign countries, independent countries. But I'm sure we can find you interlocutors in Brussels that will help you uh, interact with, uh, with European level. There are business uh, community, uh, organizations in Brussels and representatives of member states there so we can facilitate uh, with our services in Brussels whatever contact you may want to have with us. Mr. Ambassador, I have a two-part question. Uh, my first question is, I know that certain uh, member states of the European Union uh, from the offset possibly elected not to uh, utilize the euro as their national currency, such as Great Britain, unless that's changed. Uh, I was just wondering if the reason behind that might be that they were <coughs> hoping to prevent against an economic crisis within their own borders if something like this ever happened. So that's the first part. And secondarily, if each nation uh, had retained their own separate currencies, uh, would the, the brunt of um, a bailout for the particular country still have fallen upon the European Union if they had their own nationalized currencies? Well, uh, it's difficult to imagine a scenario, uh, an hypothetical scenario. What I told you earlier is, is that it is clear that the difficulties for the countries who would be outside the euro, imagine that they would have kept their national currency, would be far greater than the ones they're having today. Uh, but of course, the, the, the major you know, price to pay or the major cost of it uh, or the impact of it will be more on the countries individually than on the, on the system as we see today. Uh, that is a fact. This being said, uh, we live in the same region. We are integrated economies. So it's very difficult to imagine that a, a bad situation in one country would not have an impact on the others. So I think our preference was clearly to say, let's share the same currency. Let's have an economic and monetary union. Let's assume uh, the benefits of it. But together with benefits, one needs to know that when times are tough, solidarity must play a role. So this is the, the kind of equation that you have in the, in the economic and monetary union. Being part of it brings benefits. Benefits, being part of it, carries responsibilities as well. Uh, but I have no doubt that if we had been in the situation of having 16 currencies instead of one, uh, it will be much more difficult. It would have been much more difficult for most of these countries to, uh, to survive uh, uh, this uh, crisis. And the costs for those who are not directly involved would still be there. Uh, and IMF will certainly have had to intervene as well. Uh, the sharing of costs will be done in a much more uh, unorganized way than what it is now. The reasons why some countries have decided not to join are very diverse. They have to do with different factors, and each case is a different case. But it's fundamentally a democratic choice of not joining the euro. Countries like the UK or Denmark or, or Sweden uh, have decided not to join so far uh, for different reasons. It will be, take too long to go into all the details, but fundamentally it's a national, national choice. Some of these countries have at one point, here and there, almost decided to reverse their decision. Uh, uh, eventually uh, they didn't, but they may still do that. Uh, uh, we will see in the future. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Ambassador, uh, I'm a retired teacher, and one of the big differences I've noticed between Europe and America is the size of the public sector, the retirement age, the, um, the generous pensions in uh, Europe for public sector workers as opposed to America where things have been let slide, pensions are underfunded, there's a huge crisis there. Uh, what can you say about the contribution of the public sector um, costs in Europe 
to its current problem. It's true that we have different systems and, uh, and they should be respected and I don't wish to make any judgment on, on the American system uh, as compared to ours. We have a different, I believe, different conception of the role of government. The debate I've seen in my first year here is very different from the debate in Europe. Uh, and again, we need to accept that. We have found solutions for our own problems which are different from yours. They are equally uh, respectable. Uh, the fact being that on both sides of the Atlantic, we have a problem with public finances. We have a problem with the deficit, as I've shown with the figures, and with uh, public debt. And we agree that uh, we cannot uh, start a sustainable path to recovery if we don't address these issues. Because they, they play a, a major role in our capacity to go back to sustainable growth. In Europe, you were seeing a debate where uh, the public deficit, for instance, has to be addressed by very dramatic cuts in public expenditure, by uh, important increases in taxation. Well, we believe this is a temporary uh, request or need for, for measures. We hope to be able to uh, discontinue these measures as soon as we return to a solid growth. But it's also clear that in many of the European countries there has to be a reform of the way uh, public services and the public authorities are organized. There has to be a reflection about the size of the public sector as well. This debate is taking place in Europe, which has a very different situation from the US. I understand the debate here as being as well uh, how more efficient can the state be uh, and can public uh, support to citizens be. Uh, I think the starting points are very different. Again, I don't want to make any judgment, but if I can draw a conclusion uh, based on your question, it is obvious that we have to have a serious reflection of uh, about the role of public authorities, about the role of the public sector in our, in our economies. I'm not taking sides, I'm not saying what we should do, but clearly the issue is on the table uh, and needs to be addressed uh, across the Atlantic. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for coming today. I have a question that's nearest and dearest to we as Texans hearts, and that has to do with energy. And uh, if you look at the energy uh, and oil and gas plays, especially in the US, the advent of hydraulic uh, fracturing and directional drilling has really revolutionized the industry. And so now oil and gas shale plays, which had not typically been viable, are now becoming much, much more viable. The discovery of large shale plays in the EU, particularly countries like Poland and Germany, and also traditionally non-resource rich countries like France uh, have a potential to uh, possibly make e the EU energy independent over the long term. So my question to you is, is this a, a priority for the EU? How, will it, how much is the EU willing to uh, court this foreign direct investment possibly from the US to develop the, not only the infrastructure but also the expertise in the, uh, the drilling? And uh, is this possibly a way out of uh, the current situation? Thank you. Well, I know the energy is a, a big issue in Texas and uh, uh, also a big issue in the electoral debate uh, in this country prior to the elections of ne next year. So that I don't want to get involved into the political side of the debate here. Uh, you may understand why. But you raise a number of important points, and uh, I'd like to uh, inform you about our, our positions and the, the terms of the debate in Europe. I think we have two issues here that we need to consider when we talk about energy. One is uh, energy security, security of supply. That is, the extent to which countries are dependent or are autonomous for their energy needs. 
the extent to which they diversify their dependence or they concentrate their dependence, uh, the extent to which they, they rely on, on you know, their own resources or they favor uh, resources coming from outside. In the case of Europe, it has to do with also with us sharing our resources, uh, uh, completing the internal market, completing interconnection, so that we can benefit from the resources of the 27 member states instead of being uh, individual or regional small markets. We want a big market, interconnected, in which uh, we can fully benefit from our own resources. That's one aspect of it security of supply, independence, autonomy, and all that. The second one is the environment. Energy is linked to the environment. Uh, and then you have different aspects that you can consider, but the most important one in recent years has been the debate about climate change and the extent to which uh, energy contributes or not to the climate change negative effects. And these two elements need to be considered together. And in our debate in Europe, we are trying to write, find the right equation, the right balance between uh, these different uh, considerations. We made a lot of progress and we are still, we still have a lot to do to complete the internal market of energy. Uh, you know, it makes no sense that there is no significant electric connection between France and Spain. It didn't happen in the past for protectionist reasons because there was one market here, one market there. It doesn't make sense any longer. We had issues uh, a few years ago of disruption of supply of gas from, from, from Russia through Ukraine uh, and there was a big, a big crisis in Europe. And we found that there was no connection of gas supply among member states. So if one country was, was supplied solely from Russia, could not benefit from resources existing next door simply because there was no uh, uh, gasoduct. There was no, you say gasoduct? Anyway, there was no connection between the two. The same for electricity, as I said earlier. So we have a lot to do there to reassure ourselves uh, that we are on the right track. On the climate change side, you know, greenhouse, greenhouse effect, greenhouse gas, uh, you know, they contribute to climate change. We're trying to address that situation by developing renewable resources, by increasing uh, the role of nuclear in, in our energy mix, by bringing together uh, new efforts on research in order to develop clean uh, technologies and all. In this debate, shell gas comes in as a, as a new reality, right? It's, it's almost everywhere. It's relatively available. It's uh, an indigenous resource. It's ours. You don't have to import it. Uh, so it can be very attractive. And uh, it's a new, a new reality. But again, there you have to look at the two sides of, of the issue. There are some environmental issues there. Uh, the technology is not maybe not yet fully developed and we need to invest there. So I will put this, the, the shell gas case, as a good example of uh, the need to bring together different inputs into the discussion if you want to find the right, the right uh, solution. The climate today in Europe is, of course, open and favorable to look at the shell gas as, a, as an alternative, but there are, in many countries, the concerns expressed about the environmental impact of the, the existing technologies to uh, explore uh, shale gas. So, to be continued, uh, very important for the future of our energy uh, mix, and uh, fundamentally, again, you know, we are facing the same problems as the US. How do we square the circle in this uh, particular case? And again, I won't comment on the US, on Europe is a big issue and we are addressing this. It has foreign policy implications, clearly. If you think of Russia, if you think of, uh, of the Gulf countries, if you think of Algeria, um, if you think of dependence from the outside, 
it's a fascinating subject if you are studying energy or interested I uh, congratulate you it's uh, it's a very important uh, policy area thanks for coming um, we appreciate you being here today. I wanted to ask you really briefly, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this question, um, but many economists have argued that because Greek default is inevitable, that Greece should stave off accruing the additional uh, expenses of trying to, to stave off a debt that is uh, inevitable in, in the view of some economists. And I wanted to ask you if allowing Greek default is an option that's being debated as something on the table. And if it's not, I would like for you to justify why that should not be debated or why that should not be considered. Well, I told you earlier that one of our priorities today <clears throat> is, to, um, is to deal with the Greek crisis, the Greek problem or the Greek issue in a way that uh, prevents it from having a contagion effect on, the, on other countries from having a, an effect on our system. We've done a lot already, as you know, uh, and we will continue to do so. Uh, different options are on the table, and we are looking at different possibilities of policy action. But of course, we always have to consider uh, the costs involved in all these different options. And uh, I've seen here and there a little bit too simplistic uh, conclusions regarding uh, the option you referred to, ignoring uh, the associated costs, certainly for the country concerned, but also for other countries and uh, for those who, have, uh, who are on the debtor side, the banking system as well. So this is what we're looking at, to see uh, how much we can do to reach our goal, minimizing the costs of any option. So I'm implicitly criticizing the idea that default as such is the way forward uh, without considering all the associated costs. So we'll see what we come up with, uh, but there is a you know, solid reflection about ways and means to help Greece without having an impact in our overall system. We have time for maybe one more quick question. Yeah, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for coming and um, for sharing your ideas. Uh, your arguments for why the U.S. and the EU need to be um, respectful of their interlinkages is very convincing, and and your reasons for why, um, in terms of business and consumers, um, a continuation of the euro, the success of the euro is really important, makes sense. Obviously, um, for policymakers, for the um, politicians involved in this question, it's probably not debatable that the euro should survive. But in terms of politics, the voters may eventually have something to say about this. And I'm wondering if you could just comment on your ideas about the long-term success of the euro as there's increased voter frustration within individual European countries, um, I think the Slovakian hesitation in the parliament to approve the most recent um, proposal is a good indication of the fact that it's not just about the administrators, the ministers, and the politicians, but ultimately there may be huge back um, sliding within various European countries. And if you can just address what you think, what you see coming down the road politically. Well, it's a very, very good question, a very important one, and uh, I would say even the most important one. Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, the, the European Union project is about people. Uh, it's supposed to benefit people. It was decided uh, and supported by people in a democratic way uh, throughout the, the whole existence of the first the European communities and now the, the European Union. And it only makes sense if the citizens support it and are behind it. Otherwise, this is fundamentally a democratic process, uh, bringing together countries and citizens. So it's a fundamental question to make sure that citizens are supportive, they understand the reasons why we're doing it. I said that I was optimistic, I said that I believe that the euro will survive, which was the theme proposed for this 
a discussion. Also because I believe, and I have evidence of that, that our leaders are actively engaging in making the case of the European Union, of the euro single currency, of the euro area, to their respective domestic political constituencies. And this is very important because voters, citizens, need to be, need to understand and need to be told by politicians how important this is and why it is good for the countries. So there has, uh, we need a little bit of explanation to be made. And I think what I see today in Europe is politicians and political leaders being more aware of the need to do that. Uh, if you see uh, the evolution of public opinion in a number of member states, you would find, you know, in some areas, more doubts about Europe now than maybe a few years ago. But you also see uh, more doubts uh, in public opinion about governments as such and the political establishment as such. So it's not an exclusive of, of Europe that people are sort of criticizing or asking questions or doubting. You know, you look at the popularity of our uh, politicians or um, parties or parliaments in our countries and uh, you see that there is overall a, a questioning of the political establishment. And what you have in Europe is that Europe has moved from a sort of uh, relatively limited political process dealing at the beginning only fundamentally with a few economic issues to one that has opened, that has enlarged covering you know, everything in the political debate. Today in Europe, what we discuss are things that affect people's daily lives. So Europe, as such, has become part of the political establishment in Europe, as much as national governments or national parliaments. So it's only normal that, as the other actors, it is also being questioned and challenged uh, by the public opinion. That's why I say it re this situation requires that our political leaders engage more with the citizens trying to explain why they think this is good for them. At the end of the day, as you rightly say, the voters will decide. Uh, I'm confident that they will keep supporting the European Union project. But for that to happen, we need uh, more engagement of the political elites in the debate about European affairs. If you take the case of Germany, and if you read the papers these days, there are a few articles interesting about that, which show that what was believed to be a few months ago a, a major trend in German public opinion against Europe, for different reasons, including the case of Greece, there seems to be now a, a reassessment of where the German interest lies, fundamentally, as far as Europe is concerned. And so I believe there is a, a shift in the way people perceive. You know, I, 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 I use an expression which uh, tries to reflect what I think about this. When you are close to the abyss, you have a clearer view of what is below. So you understand, you know, how much is at stake, you know uh, what the alternative is, and you begin to realize in a more clear way how important it is to preserve what you have already uh, achieved. Thank you very much. Thank you.